Hi everyone, it's Susan Thornton, CEO of the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, and welcome to our May edition of Facebook Live. And tonight we're going to be talking all about patient empowerment, and our guest is Leora Lowenthal, who is the Senior Clinical Social Worker at Beth Israel Deaconess Hospital in Boston. Welcome, Leora. Hi, Susan. Wonderful to be here. Thanks for joining us tonight. And this is an interesting topic. We haven't dove into something other than our Facebook interview. So this is gonna be kind of fun and a horse of a little different color. So Leora, just out of the box, why don't you share a little bit about your background and the work that you do on a daily basis? Okay, uh, I'd be happy to. I'm, so as you know, uh, I'm an oncology social worker by profession, and and um, that can mean many different things. Uh, in my case, it means I am a, a licensed clinical social worker who has uh, training and, and special interest and expertise in oncology, and I've worked for the, the last 22 years or so. Um, it, in the oncology world um, with a special focus on the experience of people diagnosed with cancer uh, and their friends, their loved ones, uh, and also the, the communities uh, like Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, which help take care of uh, that larger group. Uh, what I do on a day-to-day -day is I currently work uh, based in an outpatient cancer center and uh, my role involves working with the medical team, so uh, the medical oncologist, radiation oncologist, um, surgeons, nursing, physical therapy, nutrition. Uh, there's there's such a, a large gamut of, of different and important providers. Um, we work together uh, to take care of patients who come to the cancer center for treatment and their families, of course. Uh, that involves a lot of counseling, both individual, family, and and, uh, and group, and also um, a lot of work to help people get connected to resources in the community. Um, I think, as you know, it's, um, I know, as you know, uh, based on the foundation's experience, how, how hard it is to cope with some of the practical challenges that come up with any diagnosis, uh, any cancer diagnosis, certainly. Um, that's that's a nutshell, <laughs> which I know is only, scratching, know is the only surface. scratching the surface. Yeah. Um, so, um, and so, so the I think one of the questions that I've had and that I would love to know, and hopefully some other people would know, would like to know how how do you engage with a social worker? Um, I know for me personally. I didn't realize that this kind of service and support even existed, and no one told me mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So maybe you can talk a little bit about, from a patient's perspective, how would they connect with with someone like you in your position? No, and I think this comes up quite a bit in terms of, um, well, for the cutaneous lymphoma community in particular, um, there's. There's often uh, such a focus, at least initially, on dermatology, uh, as opposed to necessarily the time spent in the hematologist's office, or um, and maybe I shouldn't say more time, but I think because so many people are first coming through dermatology offices, they're less likely to come into contact with oncology social workers. Uh, you, are, you are generally more likely to be an oncology social worker to uh, a place like the one where I work, which has a dedicated cancer center. And, mm -hmm. and there are additionally wonderful, and this is where this becomes, I think, important, there are wonderful community organizations. So that, um, let's say you're somebody who has early stage um, cutaneous uh, T-cell lymphoma, and you're not seeing a hematologist, or you see someone, but you see them once a year. And, you don't want to make that necessarily the place where you're going constantly, or maybe it's just not conveniently located. It may be that you went to a specialist, but that person is really quite far away. 
And so you need social work in your community. Uh, usually then what I recommend is that people use access to any number of, uh, I'll just list a few organizations, but places like um, Cancer Care, which is based in New York City, and uh, the Cancer Support Communities, which is really all over the country, um, and, which was once known as Gilda's Club and Wellness Club, if, if um, I'm sorry, Wellness Community, uh, for people who may be familiar, uh, the Leukemia Lymphoma Society, uh, Lymphoma Research Foundation, and and of course the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation, which can help, at the very least, help guide people. Not to say that these organizations can all provide access to a social worker immediately. Uh, many of them can. Many of them will. Uh, it's certainly, cancer care. You can call and speak to a social worker. You can join a, a support group online that is going to be moderated by an oncology social worker. Um, I think that at the core of it, what I would like to say is that so many people with uh, early stage cutaneous lymphoma do not necessarily recognize that they can access services for for patients with a cancer diagnosis. I think there is sometimes confusion about that. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. Um, just speaking from my own experience and thinking that, gosh, I have to figure this all out on my own and I'm not sure where to go or who to talk to, or I'm not even sure what resources I, I am either eligible for or that I can access. I think, especially as a newly diagnosed person, when you enter this world, it's so overwhelming. And I wish I had known that I had other options and resources. Um, and, and that kind of segues us into maybe the discussion about how do we empower ourselves and maybe taking a perspective of where do you, where do you start as a, even a newly diagnosed patient person um, or someone that uh, they're a family member or somebody that's trying to support a, someone who's diagnosed, uh, like, what do you do first? <laughs> What would some of your thoughts be? Uh, okay. I Well, it depends. If I was going to give an answer that I think could work for anyone and everyone, uh, I would say the first thing you do is find a community that is already in some way familiar with this experience. Um, so again, I'm going to sort of keep coming back to this, but I think particularly for those who are diagnosed or who love someone who has been diagnosed with an orphan disease or a, you know, a, a rare disease, um, likely they haven't, they haven't in their day-to-day -day experience already run into this before. And it can be so wonderful and valuable to, to find other people who already know a little bit of what lies ahead. You know, and this is, um, I see this all the time with, as I, as you know, I, um, I help uh, moderate a list serve online, uh, not, not affiliated specifically with the organization, but for the cutaneous lymphoma community. And it's existed somehow forever. It started originally by Judy Jones when I think, you know, computers were nine feet long. Uh, and <laughs> It's, it's this sort of amazing community of, of people who, uh, many of whom come on when they're first diagnosed and are saying, can anybody else tell me, you know, what the heck is going on? <laughs> what is this, this crazy diagnosis I've just gotten that nobody has ever heard of and I can't find a doctor that says they specialize in it and where do I even start? And, and I often then see on the list, um, as moderator, we tend, I, I tend to, anyway to take a pretty quiet stance and uh, I, I enjoy so much watching the way people help each other. And very often what people do is direct somebody who's newly diagnosed to go to the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation webpage and for instance, look at uh, the links that show you where you may be able to find some specialists who have self-identified and been uh, sort of verified as people who specialize and treat uh, significant numbers of patients with these diagnoses and 
so that's as a starting point, I think, knowing where to look to see, well, is there information out there? And the second, the second is maybe a broader question, which is that uh, it doesn't matter what, I think what the diagnosis is or what the exact situation is, it's always hard to know how to be helpful. Uh, it's always, and there's certainly no one answer. And um, that is where I tend to think that uh, social work can be quite helpful. If, if someone is having trouble at sorting out uh, particularly, you know, for most people, um, even if we're grateful to have help offered to us, we really don't want to be in a position where we need help. And uh, we, we may have a very clear sense of what we want to support and we perhaps have never had to identify that before. And, uh, and I, I often work with people and their families or friends uh, just to figure out well, how do you how do you have those conversations even about um, what is going to be helpful? Does the person want you to go and start researching things on, online for them? Uh, would they rather that you not talk about it? Um, there's there is no one answer, of course, but but getting communication going helps. And I'll stop talking for a minute. <laughs> no, I was just thinking in my mind, um, that's a really good, a very, very good point from, and again, I, I speak from my own experience as a patient and someone who felt like I didn't want to need it. I didn't want to need anyone's help, yet there were plenty of times when I wish I had help, but I really didn't know how to ask for it. I didn't know how to articulate that. And in my mind, it was either a sign of, of weakness, like I couldn't handle it myself, or I was afraid I might burden my family and, and worry them too much if I asked for help. So, um, and I don't know if other people have that same kind of feeling, but maybe you can give some, provide some thoughts on communicating in a way that um, I, I think sometimes communicating is really hard. <laughs> I think it's one of the hardest things I've had to learn how to do. Um, Dedicated my have any ideas? Trying to understand this. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. I, look, I, what I would say is um, a, a couple of things, which is, uh, yeah, this is hard. <laughs> and that often the, the simplest thing to do is to, the, one of the things I always tell people is to just recognize in advance that you will probably have friends and family who, and this is almost always true, who want very much, you know, most desperately to be able to help in some way, um, who feel powerless, who feel mm. that there is nothing. Uh, that they're that they can do to take away this this stress or this experience that's happening and that it can be an extraordinary gift to give someone a simple way to be helpful um, something as simple as it would actually be great if you would um, make dinner for my kids next week you know or if you could walk the dog uh, the week after I have a surgical procedure, or um, or if you could just come out for a walk with me this weekend because it's good for me to get exercise and get out of the house and I don't feel motivated on my own. Whatever it is, um, as much as I personally also hate to admit it, um, as humans, we do occasionally need help and support, it's useful to be able to sort of embrace that about yourself, figure out what actually would be helpful and pleasant, and, and then sort of offer that up as ways for people to, um, to actually engage and, um, and help you, instead of making them That's guess. Mm. That's, That's a very good point. So. Yes. I mean, how many of us have gotten 
libraries full of books that we'll never want to read because we didn't say to the person, well, the last thing I want is, you know, whatever it is. Um, I, so yeah, to some extent, I actually, um, I'm such a believer in the idea that if we could just make communicating about these things more normal, uh, if we could, mm. if we could just say, but of course we have to talk about that. Of course, that doesn't. Nobody psychically knows. And one of the things I always tell people when they're first diagnosed is, um, this is probably terrible that I say this, but yeah, I often do say it. Um, that you should expect that that 99 out of 100 people will say something wrong, because there is no right or wrong, but still. They'll say something that in the moment feels wrong to you. And and you'll have to find ways to, to work to, to either teach them or forgive them or figure out what they meant or or not forgive them. But but you have to expect that things won't there's no script for this, right? There's some um, so yeah, you do it together with your friends and loved ones. Yeah, that's, yeah, really, that's great really great advice. advice. Thank you. I was just I thinking you know. how to script for this live. Oh, yeah. <laughs> no, I think that's great because if you, it, sometimes, uh, to your point, somebody says something and it lands for you as how could they possibly say that to me at this point in time when in fact they didn't maybe didn't have the words or they didn't have the they didn't know how to say what they really wanted to say and it came out wrong and and then we all get twisted up in our own in our own little heads um yeah. and i think when you're especially if you're the closer you are to someone um a, a spouse or a parent or a child or you know brother sister those kinds of things they're almost the most challenging relationships and the people that want to help us the most are the people that maybe sometimes the biggest loss or we get entangled um, in those things. And perhaps as a, a recommendation for empowerment when you get diagnosed uh, is, is to, um, you know, take a little bit of a risk and share what you're really feeling um, and ask from yeah. in, in a, in a, more vulnerable way. I know for me, I hate to be vulnerable and I don't like people to um, see that I'm not perfect, right? <laughs> um, and I think that's hard. Yeah, I, I agree. So, I agree. And then that gives people space to, to kind of just be normal and be themselves and make mistakes and not have to work, walk on eggshells and worry about, um, oh my gosh, did I say the wrong thing or or I don't really know what to do. So that's very good, I think, wise, wise advice. And then we all have to go practice that somehow. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's easier to say, you know, it's always easier to say rhetorically. Um, but yes. It's sort of, I think of it as, you know, setting one's expectations up front. This is genuinely a stressful experience. It doesn't matter how, how, fantastic your prognosis and how easy your treatment will be. It is stressful to be told you have a cancer diagnosis. I, I never met anyone who said to me, you know, no, that was just, that just blew right past me, zero stress. And it's, it's stressful for your loved ones or those who love you um, in the same way. It represents something. Um, Maybe this won't be true for future generations, but it's certainly true for ours, that it's a word that still holds an incredible amount of power and, and the fear of, of mortality. And so that comes along and it shakes everyone. And, and yes, we, I think we all have to expect that at that moment in time, everyone will be off their, off their game. Mm -hmm. And the, the best way to find your way through is, is together with your loved ones and then hopefully again with a larger supportive community um, like this one. Yeah. So we have um, a question from our mm -hmm. wonderful, amazing audience. So I'm going to ask it and we'll take it from there. Uh, 
Hi, I have MF stage 1B on targretin and light, lighting or probably UVB three times a week. It's frustrating, but I've got to remind myself that I have, and I'm, I'm missing a, sorry, Mike, I can't see the whole, um, the whole to quote remind here. myself that I have cancer, is that normal or a form of denial? A, a normal, that it's normal. That it's, that it's normal to feel that way and it's not a form of denial. Uh, I that's think a there's a question. question. Yes. Um, yes, I think that, that. Yeah, yeah. And, and that you're, you know, are you grappling you know, I'm kind of with this question? I think it, it's the most, I mean, literally, it's like, okay, I have to go do this really annoying thing three times a week. And I have to use this medication that is kind of a drag. Is it legitimately annoying or irritating or frustrating? A hundred percent. And it doesn't, it doesn't matter that it may not be, maybe you say to yourself, and I hear this a lot from people, you don't have a right to complain because it, this is annoying, but it's not chemotherapy. Or this is annoying, but I'm going to survive. And and I think you absolutely have a right to complain. You, first of all, you always have a right to complain because you didn't, you didn't ask for this. It wasn't um, your life before this diagnosis was um, was probably just a little simpler. It didn't involve these three times a week treatments and and this medication. And so, what I want to say is, um, it's it is so helpful and important to stop and and make that moment of reminder saying to yourself there's a really good reason i'm doing this this is not just something that i'm doing um for the sake of being annoyed or frustrated or irritated but you don't have to pretend that it's not it's not denial if you're if you're saying like this is legit not great or not what i want to be doing at my lunch hour mm. Susan, yeah. any thoughts on that? Because I, I feel like that you could even speak to this as well. Yeah, I, um, I'm going to actually mention, we just have another little quote up here that says, love this, I have MF, and I'm also a health coach, and reaching out is so important. And I, I think through, through my journey, for sure, have had all those kinds of feelings like, um, Okay, well, this isn't so bad. How bad is it? I'm I'm going into this light box three times a week, and I come out and I have a great tan, and I look great, and I can pretend a that I don't have this yeah. diagnosis, which is a really good way of of presenting a good front to the world. Yeah. And sometimes, but then on the inside of my That's head, cool. I'm saying to myself, "Well, shoot, you know, this is a pain in the neck. I've got a." figure out my schedule and fit this in three times a week, or, you know, oh, you're man. on a medication and I've been on interferon and I was on Targret and that didn't work for me, but you know, you have other impacts um, to the way that you're living your life. And you think, well, okay, do I just suck it up and keep going? But this kind of stinks. Right. Yeah. And, um, and it's hard. I think, maybe that's, we can talk about some coping mechanisms because I also think everybody is a little bit different in how they manage um, th that kind of an impact. Um, for me, it turned out to be uh, exercise and getting outside and that, that was my coping mechanism that helped me to feel more normal, even though maybe some people would think that's not so normal, but you know, that helped me a lot. So maybe yeah. there's some, some things that you can share in your experience uh, of speaking with other kinds yeah. of people, like coping, what kinds of things can people think about to cope? Uh, uh oh, I did a <laughs> long of being able to think of things to cope, it was thinking about everything you just said, which um, I I think the other thing that's important to acknowledge is that uh, we're really talking about a, a, a diagnosis that is considered incurable and is essentially a chronic illness for many. And right. that that's a whole different ballgame when you think about um, 
right, for, for treatment three times a week for a year, if you believe that it will be a year in time and then you'll just never have to do it again. Mm -hmm. But when you do it and you know that you're going to be doing it possibly for the next 20, 30, 40 years, it's a little harder, I think, to, it's both a really good incentive to, um, to find a way to manage that. Um, one of my personal favorites, by the way, for the UV light box is to imagine that you are in solitary confinement um, and doing like cool Tai Chi, you know, keeping yourself in really good shape moves uh, or listening to educational podcasts. Um, I'm really not saying these things as jokes. I felt like it's you have to find a way to make that time yeah. feel productive or useful or calming or, um, but, mm -hmm. But boy, otherwise it's really frustrating. And um, and and to your larger question about uh, how to cope, I think look, I love that exercise works for you. You know that um, I'm I, even though exercise does work for me, I sort of resent that. Like I always I always feel annoyed that actually I do feel better when I exercise because it proves everyone's point, and I actually am terrible about it, and I, I never want to go to the gym. So. I, I would say there's people like me <laughs> where exercise might not, it might feel like more like an obligation, um, but uh, finding the things that, that, that can help you balance the stress. And again, this is very individual. I think um, I can say personally for me, uh, gardening is um, indoor gardening. I don't actually have a garden, but um, weirdly as a, you know, a, born and bred New York City girl, I'm really, I find plants incredibly relaxing. Uh, it's, it's life, it's green, it's, um, yeah, it's just relaxing. Uh, I, I am a clinical social worker, so obviously I will advocate therapy, uh, be it uh, therapy with a, a professional, um, a, group therapy, which can sometimes also just include peer counseling. Um, and uh, and I think, again, uh, there's a lot of more faith-based uh, counseling. And I think for many people, that's actually a, um, a wonderful place to start finding community is, um, or reconnecting with community is through their, their faith and, and if they are part of a community there. Um, you know, I'd also say that there's there's scales of what we're talking about with coping. There's the day to day, how do you cope with stress, and then there's the what do you do if you realize that it's not just the usual day to day stress, and maybe it has uh, lent itself to a depression or um, a, a, an anxiety. Um, for some people, I think um, certainly there's there's anxiety that develops around. Um, well, any number of things. I, I won't go into a list right now, but um, and then it becomes the question. I I, I think less of just coping skills and also um, when do you know that you need professional help or help from someone else, and and allowing yourself uh, to to ask for that. Uh, I think that's a really important part of the conversation with one's healthcare providers in general. And that if you're having trouble coping, you should be letting your doctors know. Uh, you're, if, if not, you're, let's say you don't feel comfortable talking about it with your cutaneous lymphoma specialist. Uh, talk about it with your PCP. And if you're not comfortable talking about it with your PCP, maybe get a doctor that you're comfortable talking about it with because your emotional well-being and your mental health is is so is so important and so intricately connected to everything else. And um, I, I I hope very much that people make this just a part of the conversation of how they are approaching uh, what we want to see as a lifelong diagnosis, meaning something that that you will live with and hopefully live very very well with. Yeah. And I, I think that's a great point, Liara, with regards to it's it's a very individual. And given that this disease is 
a long-term thing. And what, depending upon how you move through your journey, um, you know, there could be points in time where you're coping just fine. And then other times when you might need additional help Absolutely. or support or, and that's okay. And being, um, and I, I don't know, you know, it's probably very individual per person, right? When, when that time comes to when you need to seek maybe more professional help. Um, but talk, I being I able to it. talk to your, yes. Yeah. Go ahead. I think that the, the, you're right. There's, it's very individual. There's no one answer. But what you're really looking at is when someone says, these feelings I have are affecting my functioning. Um, mm. I mean, that's if you want to reduce it to something as simple as that, if you have to just come up with one time when you can say to yourself, maybe I need help, is when you sort of take a look at yourself and go, oh, I'm I'm just not kind of performing as well in life as I as I am used to. Um, I often what I what I hear when people who have been depressed uh, feel better, what they say is, I feel myself again. I feel like I'm back to being myself. And I I and often people say to me, well, and, and so if they're talking about a long period of stress, they might say there's been this prolonged period of time where they're finding it harder to function at work or they are um, they're finding that the stress is very significantly impacting their relationships with family and friends um, in ways that, that are troubling to them. If it's creating distress for you and it's and it's somehow changing what you what you feel you can and can't do in your life, then I think, I, I, and this to me is an empowering statement, then by all means, then ask somebody else to step in and, and give you, uh, if there's good recommendations to offer or good suggestions to offer, um, and maybe just an outside perspective. Yeah. Now, I think that's a good point too, with regards to, um, how, how do we feel if we feel we're not ourselves, if there's something not quite right that we can't get back to, then perhaps it's time to, to go talk to somebody or ask um, whether that might be a, a faith-based counselor or um, your physician or the social worker or whomever. But, you know, it can't hurt to ask a question and go talk to somebody. Never and, hurt. And I, to right? be clear, I'm not saying... Um, I don't mean, well, give it a year, you know, I mean, give it a, a, you know, if three to four weeks have passed and you're saying, I haven't slept well in four weeks, mm. every night I lie in bed and I think about this medication or, or what, whatever it is, if it's been ongoing and you don't feel subsiding and it's starting to feel to you like, why isn't this subsiding? That's sort of the moment. It's like with anything else in life, when we, if we have a pain in our knee, right? You know, you you might wait a few days and you think maybe you pulled something, but if it doesn't go away and it's interfering with your ability to perform your usual tasks in the way you like, eventually you go to the doctor or you call yeah. someone. So I yeah. think it's sort of the same. We need to give the same respect to, or the same uh, the same love, you know, to ourselves and our our spirit or our minds. Yeah, no, I agree. Um, somebody is mentioning privacy and work ramifications. I'm not exactly sure. It's not really a question, yeah. but I guess. Um, yeah, it's a I, fantastic I topic. It's a big one. So if that person yeah. could um, just clarify a little bit more about what they're asking, that would be, uh, we can hone in a bit, maybe. Right. Right. Yeah. And I think, you know, there's, uh, oh, here we go. Um, the one thing I struggle with is having a condition that is long-term, but will hold me back on making important decisions. I feel like the what ifs keep me from moving forward in life with everything. I feel stagnant. Wow. That's a great question. Right. Cause you, you just feel like, oh, when's the other shoe going to drop and my life is going to totally shift. So how do you keep, how do you move forward? 
even though, in spite of. Yeah. I'm gonna, I'm going to try to answer this again in a very, um, my apologies, like a very generic sense because right. I don't know the specifics of the person's situation. But what I, what I try in general is to, um, is to to try to distinguish between the things that the things that we we can change or somehow impact by worrying about and uh, and and saying to ourselves, but what if that happens? And I'm going to keep worrying that that could happen, even though that it's, it's just as possible that it won't happen, but it could happen. Versus the things that we really can't. Um, I forget which one I started with, the things we really can affect versus the things we can't. Um, what I do think is that probably, and I don't know, probably maybe this person's talking about fears of what if it gets worse? What if it's, uh, what if it recurs? Um, I don't know. I don't know if this is a question of, um, for a young adult, uh, will I have to do a treatment that affects my fertility? Um, for an older adult, uh, is this going to mean that I want to retire earlier and I have to save more? There's so many possibilities of what the person, you know, here is thinking, but in general, I, I do, I always try to ask myself um, if, I try to ask myself if the, the same risk existed before and I just didn't know about it. So um, what I would say I mean by that is um, life is uncertain in general, and uh, we're all at risk all the time. For so, I, this makes me sound terribly gloomy, and I don't mean to. I just mean uh, life does not come with guarantees. Uh, no, no guarantees about illness, about um, having. I think I've, I've shared maybe once before. Um, my father's favorite New Yorker cartoon. It shows a man walking down the street. He's so happy and he's he's got a checklist of all the things that went well at his doctor's appointment. And there's a huge safe that's about to fall on his head. It's falling out of a window. Um, and you know, my dad just cackles and he thinks it's just hilarious. This idea that, uh, I think it's hilarious, but it's, but it's true. Um, everything can be going just fine and we can have a safe drop on our head. So, um, we could all worry every minute of every day, or or we can triage our worries and we can figure out which ones are truly things we can change or affect or or navigate, and and then the ones that are just they're just there to torment us and there's nothing at all we can do with them. Those are the ones I think sometimes you have to figure out how you're going to put them in, in special containers. Mm -hmm. I'll, I'll go into that some other time in some other lecture. <laughs> so, yeah. um, but, but it's, uh, yeah, it's a hard balance and I respect the question. Um, yeah, yeah, and maybe, yeah, I, and maybe as, as I was listening as to you, um, it, it occurred to me, that as an individual trying to uh, hone down on what is the real fear and if you can narrow that down into what it is then you can take some action on it or maybe that is also a point where you need to make a decision to talk to a professional of some nature yeah. to try yeah. to help you move forward yeah, yeah. um so oh, well, and i know i've experienced this but you know, the financial stress of dealing with this, especially because it's a chronic long-term yeah. condition. Um, and, you know, in our current health environment, um, it's really challenging. Um, you know, how, how do, and A, I don't know if oncology social workers um, have any, any play or input into the financial um, stress, or how do you how do we try to manage that component? I think that's that's hard too. Uh, Susan, that's another hour. That's a but I of know. Course, no. We'll have to bring you back. We'll have more conversations. <laughs> I I by which I mean uh, 
find the, the cost of healthcare, uh, the just figuring out what one's cost will be, um, understanding actual real cost and then the future costs that you don't yet realize are going to come up. And by that, I mean um, the, the fear that you will have a harder time getting affordable healthcare insurance uh, because you have now this diagnosis. Um, right. the, the transportation cost to get to and from uh, your light box treatment three times a week, which may be very far away. I'm, I'm always really astounded by this, that it's still uh, not such an easy thing to find uh, places that mm -hmm. specialize in UV treatment um, in, in a lot of areas. And um, I mean, these are just two of the smallest examples, um, medications that are prohibitively expensive, even with the greatest of coverage. And, and navigating some of these programs really requires help. Um, that is the, you know, the, the beauty of it is there are programs like this and people who can help you, but you, you, you do, if you're, if you're running into financial trouble, I would always say, um, even something as simple as simple, but as, as straightforward as call the American Cancer Society, call whatever it is, because there's, there is no, again, there's no one answer to this. Um, people run into financial trouble for lots of different reasons. And it could be your health insurance, but maybe you have great health insurance. And the real problem is now that you really can't afford the childcare while you go to uh, your appointments. Or you found grant funding that's available for people who are a certain stage or doing a certain treatment, but you're not doing that. And when you're an orphan disease, yeah. You have to look in the broader categories. That's what I would say. You have to look in the categories of blood cancers and lymphomas and and look at what is available and out there in the world at large for people with a cancer diagnosis, because that's where you'll find the most people who are positioned to help you figure it out. Yeah, I'm not going to get well, started great. on social security disability or disability. I mean, only because that's the part where I'm like, that is... That's the biggest and sometimes the most important, um, but it's it's just huge. Um, there's an incredible organization, by the way, called Triage Cancer. Um, mm -hmm. I think it's www.triage.org. Well, they have an extraordinary amount of information on their website. And for anybody who's also the person who mentioned uh, privacy concerns and work, um, that's a wonderful resource to know about. Yeah, yeah, and actually they will be speaking again um, at our two-day patient conference in Washington, D.C. in June. So they will be uh, one of our, we, we love them, and they do, they have great, they, they're yeah, they're brilliant. Yeah, mm -hmm. they are amazing, and, and I think, you know, we do try to find all the other resources so we can help people navigate to the best place where they're going to be able to get help. Um, let's see. Yep. Wish I had more info on my particular diagnosis, cutaneous marginal zone, B cell, lymphoma. Uh, all the literature seems to be about MF. Yes, sadly, um, the, the cutaneous B cell lymphomas are even rarer of the rare cutaneous lymphomas. Um, we try to keep as much information as we can. The Good news in general is that they are very treatable and manageable most of the time. Um, we have some information on the website on cutaneous B cell lymphomas. If you have specific questions, we're happy to try to help you and navigate. Um, not to say that they are any less of an impact as someone with mycosis fungoides or the other variants of cutaneous T cell lymphomas, but they do tend to be a little bit more um, straightforward to manage than the cutaneous T cell lymphomas. I don't know, Lior, if you have any insights into the cutaneous B cells. Not to lessen the burden though, you still have the same kind of other issues and things too to deal with. Yeah. 
But to have something rare within a rare group is a, is an extra. And I saw somebody who's commented that it's just very hard not to have people to talk to you every day about this. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And that, I think the question there is, um, or the, the question that comes up for me is, um, is it about talking to people who have this diagnosis and being able to share that with them and, and share that experience? Um, is it about talking with people, um, your friends and family? Um, and if it's the first, then I would by all means say there, there are ways to at least try to find some community and um, cutaneous lymphoma um, groups that meet uh, sometimes in person, depending where you live. Uh, there's, well, there's programs like this, but actually I would think of the, um, uh, the particularly the in-person seminars and okay. the two days where you're gonna meet people. Um, going to, or joining online, um, resources, but I, uh, I agree. It's hard. It's hard if one wants to talk about something every day and doesn't feel that they have a place to do that. And, and I would wish that for everyone. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. And, and we are always available if people want to give us a call or we will do our best to be able to lend an ear, um, and provide someone that understands the disease and, and even if it's just to listen. Um, the question that just came through with regards to the fear of, of um, not knowing if or when it will return and they're uh, 1A for 10 plus years. Um, yeah. You know, that's usually a good sign that, that it's a very stable disease and it'll just stay the same, but that's not to say that things won't change at some juncture. Any thoughts on how, I guess that's, you know, how do you manage that, the things that go through your head over the course of time, you know, waiting for that other shoe? Uh, I, <laughs> I have a very particular approach, which does not work for everyone, by the way. Um, my way of dealing with stuff like that is to just really just say it straight out. Um, identify what the fear is, as you said before, a little bit, mm. and then uh, try to, walk through what exactly uh, is the worst case scenario and what can I do yeah. to be totally prepared if that does happen. So, um, and since I, since I work in oncology and I now know enough to be scared of everything, I'm worried about every possible cancer and every disease. And, um, and I have, you know, always get the best insurance I can get. And I, I, and I do, I do live life actually as someone who plans for the possibility yeah. that that bad things can happen. Um, and I do I do think it's reasonable to worry about like we were saying before, it's reasonable to worry about recurrence. The the point is though that worrying will not change um, whether or not it happens. So so then instead, can you just do something to make sure that you feel that if it does happen, you will really be prepared? Um, this is also something I, I say to other people and I say to myself about self-care, which is, um, it is it's, it's good incentive sometimes to just take care of our own bodies and the idea of, uh, I want to be in in good fighting shape if anything if anything comes up and and in general i think with all of these things it's about um how can we take that that energy that goes into the worrying and the stress and and just direct it into self-care and mm. uh, it's an idealized way of just saying it but it's what i'd like to see us all be able to do yeah, no, and I think that's a really good point. Um, and let's see, we have a, a statement here. I had to find a specialty pharmacy for Valcor and they quoted me about $1,875 a tube and they couldn't afford it. So the pharmacist said no problem and answered five questions. So now it's $10 for a small tube. And um, 
Yeah, so that's, I think, the challenge of our healthcare system. Um, my recommendation is, is never take the first answer that you get <laughs> and just just keep keep asking. There's a lot of options out there that sometimes um, you just have to keep asking. And and if you run into challenges, again, give us a call because there are programs and sometimes people aren't aware of them. Pharmacies aren't aware of them. It, sadly, our, our system's just so darn complicated. It's, um, it's hard to figure it all out. Uh, and, and the more I learn, the more confused I get. So we try our best to keep our fingers kind of in the mix and, and know what's going on so we can help guide and direct folks. And I don't know, Lior, well, if you have any other recommendations um, being in a I think you know, know cancer that I, center. Uh, look, if it's different. If you're at a cancer center, um, there is almost always a social worker or a community resource specialist or a financial aid specialist um, you can talk to, hopefully all three. Uh, as I as as I often tell you, I I don't think that the Cutaneous Lymphoma Foundation can possibly keep up with the, mm. the rapid fire changes in what happens with uh, pharmaceuticals, um, the the pricing. The, the drug coverage programs, it's, it's all too fast for anyone to keep up. And I, I do usually refer people, um, if they're really having questions and I can't find something, like I might go to um, needymeds.com or just do, mm -hmm. there's a, a number of different resources where you can look and see, are there even some programs, patient assistance programs? But often I, I will end up referring them to a local, um, a local organization that can help with this. So in Massachusetts, there's a group called SHARE um, mm -hmm. and, I'm sorry, not SHARE, SHINE. Um, and they do wonderful work um, teaching and uh, and connecting people with certain organizations that um, can help them figure out how to approach their, their insurance choices, their prescription coverage. Um, yeah, that's, uh, it's, it's yeah. just, my basic advice is find the people either even at your pharmacy or locally at your senior center or at, a, at your doctor's office who will know what patient assistance programs exist and how to help you navigate because your insurance will make a difference and so will your um, your finances, uh, your pre-existing finances. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, I, and there are resources out there. I think that kind of sums up what we've been talking about is we each have to kind of take the bull by the horn sometimes, whether it's um, asking for help from family and friends, maybe very directly, or seeking someone that has special knowledge based upon what the issue is that we're dealing with. Um, you know, being open to asking for professional help if, if we feel that that's um, kind of where we are. I, I think that's all part of empowering ourselves. We didn't even get to talk about, you know, how do you empower yourself in your conversation with your physicians? Maybe we'll have that be our next discussion and we'll just focus on that part. There's just, you know, this is a big topic, but I know we're coming up to the top of the hour here and I think we have answered the questions that have come through and I want to make sure that you have um, you know, a little bit of time left in your evening before you have to get some sleep so you can go back to work tomorrow. But really, Leora, thank you so much for joining us. It was really wonderful to have you um, share your wisdom and knowledge and uh, really some, I think, very practical and tactical suggestions. And um, hopefully we'll have you back soon. And Again, it's been a delight and an honor to have you with us and really appreciate it. Thank you so much. And um, I'll just say quick, you know, next month we'll be back on our Facebook Live um, Thursday, June 7th at 9.30 p.m. Eastern Time. And we'll have Dr. Oleg Akalov talking about skincare. So lotions, potions, wet wraps, and some practical things on how to manage skin in this disease, which is a really big deal. And I'm sure we 
won't fit it all into an hour, but we hope you will join us and bring your questions. So um, thank you again, Leora, so much. Just, you. <laughs> just want to really hug you. <laughs> thank you. Yeah. Yes, thank you so much. And thanks everybody for joining us tonight. We really appreciate it. I hope this was valuable and gave you some food for thought and some tools that you can take and use in your own life to help kind of manage this whole big thing, we uh, uh, managing cutaneous lymphoma and living with it in an empowered way. So for that, I'll say good night to everybody and really um, have a good one and enjoy the rest of your evening, day, or the upcoming weekend. Thanks everybody, take good care. Good night. Good night.